スロスドーンシュeveryone and welcome to the Shiro Editor's Corner, a completely new and unscripted series of mini casts. Come join your elder Shiro's as we reminisce on our favorite Saturn memories in this new and nostalgia packed podcast series. Hey everyone, it's Saturn Dave and I've got Mel, Sega Lord X with me. How are you doing, bro? I'm doing good, man. You, you keeping dry? You hear you got a nice storm, but it's like rain right now, right? So, <laughs> yes, the the ice isn't supposed to start until the morning. So hopefully, I won't lose power because I have a video to put up, and that's really gonna delay things if the power goes off for two or three days. Oh no, kidding, man! You <laughs> you and and Sam down in Louisiana, you know, you guys like got the weather going on, right? I have nothing to complain about being in San Diego. Like if it's a little cold here. I'll have to deal with it because it's nothing compared to what you guys deal with. No, man, I'm actually, see, I'm in Virginia. So I'm actually in the mountains here in Shenandoah Valley. Right. And dude, whenever bad weather comes through, it, it almost assuredly nails us because we're in, you know, we're in between two mountain ranges. So typically when the ice or the snow hits Virginia, it's going to get us. And in this case, it looks like we're going to get the ice storm that they're calling for. Hmm. Hmm. Would you say you're in that like Silicon Valley of the East kind of thing? The, the Virginia tech belt? Yeah, that's exactly where I am, actually. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good schools over here. Uh, there's a lot of good breweries over here making decent beer. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of cider places that, you know, they, they bang out some really good stuff over here. And, uh, you know, I mean, for as far as country living, I don't think you can really beat it mm -hmm. just as far as clean air yeah. and, you know, good living. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've thought about moving a few times to get closer to a larger city. But every time I do, I just think I'm really going to regret this. And <laughs> it, it usually knocks me back. I mean, down you probably earth. are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, you know, I visited there a few years back. Um, well, I visited Baltimore. We, we drove through Virginia. I think we went through Harper's Ferry. I didn't think to like reach out at that time, but like next time I come through Virginia, I'm for sure going to hit you up. But, uh, you know, the food there is great. The weather, uh, it was actually really nice weather when we were there and yeah, just so much green, so, so, so many trees and rolling Hills and stuff like that. So that's the beautiful thing. Yeah, it really is, man. The, the mountains over here, they're, they're not the size of the ones in Colorado, but right. You well. know, you know, it's still just a beautiful area, man. You know, I, I grew up here. It's it's always been home. And the idea of leaving sort of, you know, it's interesting to me. But at the same time, I know I'm almost for sure going to regret it if I do it. No kidding. Well, <laughs> as a uh, clever transition into what we're going to be talking today, what kind of obstacles would you say you face uh, with collecting video games? in your climate or where you're, where you're from? Oh, it, it, to put it bluntly, it was awful growing up. Um, there's nothing here, you know, as, mu okay. as much as I love the area and the fresh air and there's really no big cities really close to me. So mm -hmm. of course you had to rely on the mom and pop shops in these little towns to really collect anything. And that was actually really, really difficult because nobody ever really has anything. And when they do get something in, they want a fortune for it because it tends to be so rare in this area. And it's been like that for a very long time. And of course, it's actually gotten worse in recent years because, as you know, mom and pop video game stores they tend not to stay open too long in the smaller towns. So we'll get something. It'll open up. It'll last maybe a year, two years if you're lucky. And right. then, and then it goes out of business. So of course, you can't sustain, right? Yeah. You can't, there's nothing to sustain them. And that usually leads to having to go back to 
eBay, you know, uh, collector boards, you know, the various areas that you get your games from, you really have no choice but to get them online. Well, I was just curious, um, and we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, just just from a weather aspect, from a climate aspect, uh, I know that, like, for example, my bro Pat, he lives in Arizona. It's very dry there. As far as maintaining and keeping the collection that he has in good condition, it, you almost don't have to do anything. It's dry, you know? So it's like, as long as you keep them away from sunlight, you know, it's fine. But I notice you have a, a mast, despite your uh, obstacles, you've amassed quite a collection behind you. Oh yeah. Um, do you, so nothing like Florida where like they have like humidity for days and it's like, I, I always hear don't buy games from Florida <laughs> because <laughs> you'll get all the water damage and the wavy manuals and stuff. But yeah, uh, actually no, for me, man, really the only time that we really get you know, crushed with humidity is Mm -hmm. during the summer months. So you're pretty much looking at just June, July, August, Mm -hmm. and then it's pretty dry, you know, the rest of the year. So Virginia is actually, you know, it's pretty easy to take care of your stuff. Um, I would never, ever put my stuff in a storage unit that wasn't, Mm -mm. You know, right. Environment control. Yeah, climate controlled, right. control, man. But you in a basement there or in just in a room? Oh, this is just a room that you see. Just a room. Me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is no risk of flood or anything like that. Oh, no. Where I'm at in Stanton, dude, we are, yeah. we're, we're pretty far away from anything that could flood us. Okay, cool. Because, you know, it's all, it's crazy when you, you hear about those guys in like the Pacific Northwest where it rains a lot, you know, maybe Oregon or Washington and they're, they got their collection in a basement. I'm just like, no, 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 no. no. You're just, you are just asking for, it. you better insure the entire thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So, okay. So for folks who may not know, maybe you didn't read the YouTube description or whatever, <laughs> we're talking about collecting uh, specifically for Saturn, but you know, we might, you know, skirt around different uh, areas of collecting. But um, just to kick us off, let's talk about, I've interviewed you before. We've talked about your past with the Saturn and everything. You did mention kind of uh, importing a lot at your mom and pop shops, right? So that's obviously one way that you you brought in a lot of uh, Saturn goodness. I'm curious though, what are your thoughts on, let's talk Saturn collecting in the 2000s versus the 2010s versus the 2020s what, what would you say so let's let's divide it by decades there so 2000s uh basically saturn is dead in the water in 98 right right and and then 99 and then, okay everybody's on the dreamcast craze at least 99 2000 right so i imagine that would have been a great time to pick up saturn games oh yeah. can you talk about that from experience uh yeah uh, I started collecting video games seriously probably about around 1999. That was when I finally had a really nice paying job. I had the financial freedom to really, you know, blow money on uh, my hobbies. And mm. really collecting for the Saturn for me really started right around then. And I can't even begin to tell you how much different it was back then. Saturn games were, they were nothing. You would find them at, you know, you could still find Saturn games at, you know, GameStop and Electronics Boutique back then. They typically Mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of them, but when you you did find them, they didn't cost anything. And then with, with the rise of eBay into the 2000s, even into... You know, I would say up until about 2005, Saturn games, even the Japanese ones that most people went after, were still mostly inexpensive. I mean, the fighting games that people go after nowadays, even stuff like Street Fighter Alpha 3, 50, 60 bucks you could get them for. I mean, they were not expensive. And, you know, towards the end of the, the... the 2000s, as you got closer to 2010, you started to see things pick up a little bit, but most everything was still really affordable. If you wanted it, you didn't have to spend, you know, an arm and a leg to get it, you know? Um, And it was like that particularly true too for American games, which as you know, that's very different nowadays, but um, yeah. But yeah, man, back then you would find American games on eBay and they were not expensive. 
Um, even though rare stuff like Panzer Dragoon Saka in the 2000s, particularly early to mid 2000s, what what were you looking to pay for it? A hundred bucks, maybe? You know? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't. I mean, I've heard people say, you know, like, oh, I wish I would have bought it when it was a hundred. Now I've heard people say, I wish I bought it when it was 500. Oh, yeah. It's just, uh, so I'm looking at it right now, uh, just price charting. Okay. And we'll get to that too, because, you know, that's a whole nother topic. Right. So, you know, CIB, uh, 1050 on price charting, loose, wow. 835 if you have all, all four discs. 835. Wow. Are you kidding me? And, and, you know, like, I feel like such a dick too, because, only five years ago, I was maybe giving some guy in one of the Facebook groups a hard time because, you know, he was trying to sell his copy for like 500 bucks. And I was like, no, oh, man, that's man. too expensive. It, it should be more like 400, <laughs> you know, and like seriously, like oh. now it's ridiculous. It really is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, you could you really could sell is. one copy of that game and you could fund a whole bunch of game collecting. You know? Like, yeah, you, you really you really could. could. So in 2000, like, let's say when you started, you said you started in 99, 2000. How much was a copy right. of like Burning Rangers? It's just off the top. I mean, I couldn't give you an exact because, of course, it was so like long a $50 ago, game. I, I could ballpark it. It was no more than 50 or 60 bucks. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and and I didn't start collecting again until the mid 2010s. Oh, and by that, yeah, it, that's the funny thing is because even when I started back up, you know, I, it was one of those crazy decisions. I was just like, I just love this console so much. What is money? <laughs> you know, like you know. And at that point, it was it was like 2015, and I was looking at eBay listings, and I was like, this is crazy. I thought it was oh. crazy back then. I was like, a copy of your your average games that you would pull off the shelf average saturn games were going for like between 20 and 40 and in a collector's market that's not like when you're trying to get a deal you're thinking like you want to get games for like five and ten bucks you know but no it was like you had to pay 30 or 40 for a just an average game like fighting vipers or something like that right right and now it just hurts to see some of the prices for these things, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I wanted a U.S. long box collection because that's where my nostalgia was, you know? Right. But uh, but yeah, no, I mean, even with Shiro starting out 2017, which I think was around the same time you started doing the Sega Lord X thing. Maybe <laughs> yeah. you started in 2016, around right. that time. Right. It was easy to just tell people, oh, well, you know, get the Japanese version, right? Here, <laughs> right. Here's a great, sh- here's a layer section or something. Get the Japanese one. It's 40 bucks all day, every day. 40 bucks, you know, right. 50 bucks, maybe, you know? And oh my God, like what killed Saturn collecting? <laughs> Is it, was it price charting? Was it social media? Was it YouTube? Is it WADA? <laughs> you know, like, well, you know, there's all these. To hear some people tell it, it's my fault. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm... go ahead. Let me hear your side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> we could compare notes because, you know, we've done a lot of uh, well, Saturn proselytizing. <laughs> yeah. Well, first, let me tell you what I think happened to actually kick off game prices going crazy. And there's, okay. no, there's no doubt social media played a part in it mm-hmm. because social media started exposing people to games they had never played before, games they had never heard about before. Right, yes. And this, of course, is going to drive interest. Right. And the problem was, is that right around that time that social media begins to explode, you're having people entering their 30s and 40s who are basically craving the stuff from their childhood. Absolutely. So there was a interest that was spurred on by social media to a group of people that were ready to relive their childhood. Mm-hmm. So when you put the two together, it equaled people soaking up these games like a sponge. And of course, as you know, particularly in the West, a system like the Saturn did not sell well. Not that much supply. Right. So the supply was already low. So social media spurs on people ready to buy, coupled with a low supply of what they wanted. And Mm -hmm. that gives you what you have today. 
And then you add on top of that the additional demand of all of the Sony and Nintendo fans who completely passed Saturn up and are looking to uh, to take a look at it now. And you know they're looking at YouTube videos, of course. They're they're you know scrolling through Let's Plays and stuff to figure out. Oh God, this console has a bunch of great games. This is no Atari Jaguar. This is a legit console with like an entire library of great games, you know, and if they have money to throw at it, that's the thing is it's like, you know, what will the market bear? Some folks don't even think about it. They're just like, okay. Oh no. You know? And, and actually you make a good point on that because it's really important. I think people understand that I call them mega collectors or some of my friends will call them sponges. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but there are people out there with so much money to burn and such right. a high interest in this hobby, they will literally soak up dozens of the same game, same system, same controller, same rare item, and you will walk into their collection and you will see 12 Turbo Duos. You will see you know, five um, uh, uh, super graphics, you will see they are the kind of people that every single time they run across something that they deem of value or has any nostalgia with them, they buy it and collect it. They're not, they are, and these people are actually kind of more hurtful to the hobby of gaming than resellers are because resellers will buy and then resell what they buy. So even though they will resell it at an increased price, it actually stays in the retail channel. These, these mega collectors, man, they will go in and just soak up everything that they can and it stays with them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go back out into the retail channel which means that right now I guarantee you there is some dude sitting, you know, in a forum typing away in his game room and back behind him, he's got seven copies of Panzer Dragoon Saga in mint condition because he has run across this multiple times in his collecting and he's picked it up. He's made sure he's gotten it. And those don't return back out. And I think that really makes prices go up as well, because a lot of times the games that these kinds of people find, they're not buying the broken down disc only or the broken up cases off of eBay. They're not buying the scratch disc games that you're finding in a lot of forums that people are just trying to trade and get rid of. These guys are typically soaking up the mint in box, absolutely complete. You know, they're taking away from the market the games that are really what people want the most. And that is Mm -hmm. the mint condition items. And what we have left now, honestly, is just it's eBay and places like that. That I mean, when you type in a game and you look at the list that comes up, most of the time that stuff is not in the best condition. I mean, you got to be careful on eBay. You got to really oh, look yeah. at those pictures. Oh, I don't even do yeah. it on my phone. Cause I'm like, you know, the screen's not big enough for me to really oh. like, I, I, if I'm going to do eBay, it's like, I have to have a big monitor. I got to be able to zoom in on those pictures and stuff, you know, and then, then you got to make sure you got a really good seller. Well, we can, we can talk about that in a minute, but uh, uh, I want to get back to like, okay. So bringing it all back to Saturn collecting in the two thousands versus 2010s versus 20 uh, 2020 so okay so 2000 to 2006 that that first part of the decade you didn't have youtube at all didn't exist right so what you had were websites blogs maybe you know like those kind of websites right. like retro sanctuary and stuff that would do like a top 100 list you had digital press you had yeah. you had stuff like that i'm sure that folks were looking at that stuff if they were collecting if they weren't just completely looking at xbox and playstation 2 and what whatnot gamecube if they were you know collecting saturn it was like that kind of stuff and and like you said shops w- would have stuff second hand everything was pretty cheap. You know, you had YouTube in 2006. I think classic game room was like one of the first that came on the scene. Right. right. And, uh, Mark from classic game room, you know, those were like, the, and I, I wouldn't say that at that point it was like really mainstream or anything like that, but you know, people started paying attention. You know, okay. Saturn, 
there, there's this console sale, you know, so the price start. At the same time, you got sites like price charting that pop up, right? It, oh, go yeah. hand in hand, you know, start helping, quote unquote, uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, set the price, I guess, uh, for, or get, you know, provide a reference for folks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and we'll, yeah. and we'll just say, you know, that that is a, it's a sliding scale <laughs> in terms of accuracy. Uh, and then of course, you know, social media at the same time, you know, uh, in that decade you had MySpace and stuff. And then of course, Facebook came in the latter part of the decade, uh, 2008, so, I mean, again, YouTube, price charting, social media all hit at the same time. It's a whirlwind. Yeah. Um, like you said, interest starts to skyrocket. Uh, the word gets out. N- new YouTubers are coming on the scene, like, you know, Project Co and stuff like, and, you know, Jared was doing Saturn videos for quite a long time, too. Right. And then, uh, and yeah. So then we get into the 2010s and it's already, like I said, mid 2010, 2015, it was crazy already. Oh, yeah. Um, I think the first game that I bought, coming back into my collecting was Sonic R. Right. And that was a $50 game. That was a $50 game. And I was like, and you probably think I'm crazy <laughs> for buying Sonic R for 50 bucks. Cause I know that that was not one of your favorite games. <laughs> no, it was not, <laughs> but it was one, it was a game that my good friend lent me back when I was in high school and I had memories of it, you know, so I, it was a thing, you know, I had, I had memories of this game and I needed to get it back because I, I lost his game and I ended up, he ended up like just writing it off. Like, Hey, you're a good friend, you know, whatever. But anyway, I got this game 50 bucks and I was like, what am I doing here? But you get the bug, you know, you get oh, it in yeah. your hands, you start opening the manual and you're like, Oh my God, this is my childhood right here. This is so great. You know, you get the bug and then no word of a lie you get that dopamine hit, right? You know, (laughs) and it's not just playing the game anymore. It's the acquisition of the game. It's the, it's the waiting for it to arrive. You know, I would say that for some people, that's almost a bigger hit than, uh, than reliving, you know, replaying the game. What do what would you say about that? You know, (laughs) everything you just said, man, wrong. So true. It's not even funny. Uh, Basically that's exactly how it starts. It starts out. (laughs) with you wanting something from your childhood and then it's almost a step-by-step process where every part of getting that game becomes a part of that happiness Mm -hmm. first it's looking for it it's like there's a thrill you're Mm -hmm. searching to get that game that you want for me it was really important in the beginning because of course i would go to like yard sales and you know uh, flea markets and stuff like that, trying to get as much as I could. And there was a fun in that. It was like a discovery in that. And then later when it became the internet and I was buying stuff at places like eBay, what was happening was, is, is I would get excited that the game was coming, Mm -hmm. you know? So you would go out and you'd hit the, you know, mailbox and you got the game and you opened it up and there was that tactile sensation. I finally own this. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it's like you said, it was, it was literally a dopamine hit. It was like, it made you feel good. Like, wow, I own this. Look at the manual, look at the disc. I never thought I'd have this in my lifetime kind of thing, or I've wanted this for so long, or I haven't had this in so long because the last time you maybe touched this particular game was when you were a kid, Mm -hmm. you know, and all of that just becomes part of that need and you need to feed that need. (laughs) Sometimes it's a bit anticlimactic. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, you, I mean, not not always. Sometimes it really is. You know, if it's a great game, you know, you pop it in, you and you play it. Um, but I mean, you know, to be fair, dopamine aside, I think we have nostalgia for that as well. You know, the the acquisition. I mean, think about how many Christmases could you just not wait until Christmas morning? Oh, you know, yeah. what I'm saying how many times did you play a game demo at Target or Kmart or Walmart or wherever it was? You know, how many times did you play that demo? with your head, you know, looking up at the monitor uh, before you could actually afford to buy it or before your parents would get it for you. Or if you were working a job, you know, thinking about saving up for a system or a console uh, or whatnot, you know. So I think that for gamers and collectors like this, that is something we have nostalgia for is that process of 
waiting for and then getting the reward finally at the end of the rainbow or whatever you want to look at it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, I tell you a quick story. I was um, 18 years old when the 3DO was released. Wow. And I was working a full time job as a security guard. Hmm. And the 3DO had launched and it was super expensive. But I remember not long after it launched, it hit a price drop Mm -hmm. and the price, it dropped hundreds of dollars. I mean, it was like four or five hundred dollars that it dropped down to not long after it was released. And that was when I went to get mine. Now, of course, it was still $500, and I just didn't have $500 laying around. So I had to put it on layaway. And there mm-hmm. was this little stereo shop that had a layaway system for stuff that they sold. And I went there, put a 3 do on layaway. It took me three months to pay it off. And I would go there once or twice a week and play the demo unit of the 3DO that they had up that had just Crash and Burn in it. And I would play that demo just dying for that day to come when I could pay it off and get it, man. I mean, it's stories like that that make you understand how powerful that need to relive that, not necessarily waiting the three months, but it's that incredible need to get something that you really wanted, that you worked for, or that you really liked, or that you really thought was going to be good, you know, and you're absolutely right, man. I mean, part of that is recreating that feeling, that excitement of getting something new or something that you haven't had for a while or whatever the case may be for you. That's part of the collecting experience. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, we all kind of have our, our limits, I would say, you know, some, some people set their limits higher, you know, but I think we all kind of, I'm sure you've experienced at least once the feeling of getting something that you probably paid a little too much for. (laughs) And when it comes, it's a little bit less of a climax as you thought it would be. You're just like, okay, now what here? I I own this, but does it make me an ounce happier? (laughs) You know, that's the thing is it, it's kind of like gambling, you know, it's like, you got to know your limits. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? That way you can leave the casino happy, you know, or at least, at least happy with yourself. Like you're like, okay, I came in and I had fun, but you know, (laughs) and so, you know, I, I've experienced that a couple of times where I was just like, okay, yeah, this was, this was an impulse for sure. Oh yeah. I mean, back when I was importing uh, video games, you know, it it was actually pretty terrible at times in the early nineties, man. I mean, people think I'm full of shit, you know, they'll say, Oh, you didn't, you know, import games in the early nineties. And, you know, I have to laugh at that because I guess those import shops that existed, you know, all over the U S man, I guess they were just in business, you know, without people buying games from them. But, um, but yeah, man, importing games in the early nineties was absolutely brutal on the uh, buyer's remorse because you would get something that you thought for sure was great. Right. And you would pay a premium for it and you would have to pay shipping on top of it. Some places charged a COD charge. Right. Like they tack on like a COD fee because you'd have to pay in cash. And they'd make you item. buy games you didn't even want to make it worth their while, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, and you see, man, it, it was that kind of thing. Like the buyer's remorse could sometimes be vicious because right. I, I remember importing uh Daedalus on the Saturn or oh, right. Daedalus. Yep. Mm-hmm. Robotica. You know, it was called yeah, it was called Robotica in the US, man. I imported it the day it came out sure. in Japan. Mm-hmm. And I imported it. I paid a premium to get it. I paid over a hundred dollars for it. I get the game. It's not a terrible game, but I just paid over a hundred dollars for it. Yeah, it's not a hundred dollar game. That's for sure. (laughs) Here, right, right now, CIB twenty bucks, and that's a fair. You know, that's it's that's a decent Saturn title. You can that's that's one of those chill out Saturn titles. You know, it's not you know, it's randomly generated maps. 
and you just kind oh, of yeah. go around and blow up stuff, right? You know, so it's not yeah. you don't have to think too hard to play that game. But yeah, um, it's not a hundred dollar game. It's, no, <laughs> you could have bought five of those for what it's worth. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. So that's, but I mean, you, but that's what you you pay to be on the cutting edge like that, and you were on the cutting yeah. edge of the Saturn, right? I mean, that's why you have all these wonderful stories to tell. Honestly, you know, people are gonna say what they're gonna say half of those people are idiots. Uh, anyway, I, the thing is people on the internet say whatever. And, and, and that gets back to what we were talking about. You know, you're a YouTuber, you know, you've got how many, I don't know, you got hun- over a hundred thousand subscribers. You've educated a lot of people on Saturn. Right. And, right. and one of the side effects of that is that people are going to go out and buy Saturn. It's just, it's just the way nature works. Right. You know, and they can oh, blame, yeah. I mean, you know, people can say, Oh, it's Sega Lord X's fault that the Saturn is more expensive. But I mean, no, it's your fault. Cause you're going out and buying it. You know, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. If it, if it sucked, nobody would be buying it, but it doesn't right. suck, you know, uh, which is ironic because nobody bought it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny how that works. I know, right? <laughs> but I mean, yeah, yeah, we've gotten the same thing with with Shiro, you know, here and there, uh, to to a degree, you know, like. But I, I there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to stop telling people that Saturn is great and that they should play it, you know, because the yeah. world the world has enough Nintendo channels to last us a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely do. You know, something that really you know always made me laugh was well first off i didn't start my channel until 2016 and game collecting was already out of control by the time i it started it was yeah it was exactly <laughs> so i mean i take no fault or i accept no fault in any of that man you know maybe if i had started Sega lord x back in 2005 you could blame me yeah you know but i mean I never set out to do anything nefarious with Sega Lord X, man. The no. only thing I ever wanted to do was counteract the narrative yes. that only Nintendo and Sony made good games. Right. Which I always found that to just be, I mean, I understand that they sold the most. I understand that the fans that gravitated towards that stuff outnumber Sega fans incredibly, but that in no way takes away from the legacy that these Sega systems left behind, man. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good reasons to own Sega systems. Absolutely. You, You can argue that Mario was accessible. Zelda was accessible and people found those games really easy to get into and a fan base was created that would love it forever. And I would not say a word against that. It's all true. But you cannot in the same breath tell me that a game that you never played on a system you never owned was worse or without merit, you know, at the same time. Right. You didn't. A lot of these people didn't own Sega systems back then. They didn't play the Sega games back then, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons why Sega collecting has gotten so expensive because so many people didn't own these systems, didn't play these games, right. particularly when it came to the Saturn and Dreamcast or. The Master System, because, you know, outside of the Sega Genesis sphere, Sega really wasn't all that successful in the West. So, you know, that definitely contributes to the interest in Sega today. All of these Nintendo and Sony people kind of descended upon these Sega games and were like, wow, these games are actually not bad at all. You know, and thus they started collecting and here we are. Yeah, that's one thing I do really appreciate that you've done over the years is is dispel all these false narratives. You know, Bernie Solar's responsible for everything, right? Uh, Sega Saturn was a failure. No, it wasn't. Not unequivocally. An incredible success in Japan. Dreamcast was a failure. No, not being number one doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means you're not number one, right? You know, so like, and a lot of the videos that you put out have kind of helped do that. Yeah, definitely appreciate that. And again, yeah, you got to, you know, because who else is doing it, right? The echo chamber of false narratives just becomes so loud because everybody just kind of like, 
grabs something and then regurgitates it. And then before you know it, history is written by the victors and you just, we nobody even remembers what the truth is anymore, you know? Oh yeah. And I mean, it, it, it's still actually pretty prevalent Yeah, yeah. with Sega. I mean, if you go, if you go into any forum where it's a mixed body of topics, you'll still hear the same garbage the Sega CD was a terrible add-on. It had no good games. Full motion video sucks. You know, you'll hear the same narratives. The 32X is the reason why Sega failed. You know, I mean, you hear the same garbage over and over again, even to this day. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's why it's one of the reasons why I wanted to start my channel mm-hmm. because I really wanted to keep those topics sort of you know, relevant Mm -hmm. and, 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 and keep it up with today so that it's like, look guys, they, these are good games. The Sega CD is not a complete piece of shit. The 32 X is not solely responsible for the downfall of Sega. And it has some good games too. Like it has some solid games. You, you got to know what to look for. You got to focus on the good stuff and avoid the bad stuff. That's funny though. So, okay. So you started your channel in 2016. I started my rekindling my Saturn collecting in 2015 and was looking on YouTube for Saturn related content. And I found you in the early days. I think it was like you were at a hundred subscribers or something like that. Right. And, <laughs> right. but I mean, like, that's just so funny now that I'm putting all the puzzle pieces together. I'm saying you really inspired me to within a short time, turn around and do the Shiro thing, you know, like with Pat and everything. I was like, he's passionate about it. He's doing this stuff. He's really, you know, being a town crier (laughs) for Saturn, you know, I'm like, I need to get on board with this and and do the same, you know, because like, I I feel like there's, it just doesn't get enough love. Yeah. But now here we're dealing with kind of the opposite where it's like, there's a ton of interest in Saturn now and in this new decade, and there's just not enough Saturns to go around. I mean, even even to the point where folks who were, you know, using proxies and buying off a of Yahoo auction Japan or something, you know, those sat those Japanese Saturns aren't necessarily cheap anymore. No. I mean, you could get a broken one. That's that's what people are doing now. It's like buy a broken one and just stick an ODE in it or something, right? You know, or recap it and you know, play your luck at, you know, recapping it and put a new power supply. But yeah. but yeah, I mean, what used to be the console itself. It used to be a thirty dollar console, twenty bucks on on offer up. You know, between twenty and forty bucks, you could get a Saturn. It was like a Dreamcast. You know, they were just like they just sold cheap. You know, and now I look on I look on offer up, and it's everybody's like, "Well, I know what I have." You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? It's a it's hundred and fifty bucks just for the console, no hookups. <laughs> and I'm just like, "Are you an idiot?" You know, but seriously, the market sets the price, you know, and if there's enough idiots out there doing that, it's just that it, the the result is that it's driving up the cost of the hardware, driving up the cost of the games. It's ridiculous. Yeah. The problem with that too is, man, is that, you know, what we hit upon earlier is, is that there's just not enough product there for the people that are looking for it. No. And of, of yeah. course it's driven the price up of the U S games like crazy, you know, the average price of a U.S. game now, I think is what north of fifty bucks now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I I don't own a copy of Virtua Fighter Kids, and I've been looking for it. Right, I have not been in a hurry to get a copy of Virtua Fighter Kids. It's just one of those games that you kind of kind of want, you know. I'm <laughs> like, but I don't want it fifty bucks worth, you know, like plus shipping, right? Because it's fifty bucks plus another ten for shipping or whatever, right. you know. So I'm just like ah. This is a game that I have avoided buying for over a decade now, <laughs> and I've seen it go for $15 all day, every day. Oh, yeah. And now I'm having a hard time waking up to the reality that this is a $50 game now. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, it's, it's been like that with me with a few Japanese games, G- sure, games sure. that I wanted to collect for a long time, but I just kind of laid off of it because, like you right. said, you just didn't want to pay that price. Which, of course, wound up being a huge mistake because as time went on, they became even more expensive. Right. And, of course, now I'm sitting here and I would really like to own a copy of Three Dirty Dwarves for the Japanese Saturn. Hmm. But it's gone up like crazy for the Japanese version. I mean, tell me why. Why? I have. It's got to be rarity. Oh, no, I mean, why do you want it? 
I'm just curious because you have a long box, right? uh, Yeah. Here's the thing, man. I'm not trying to do it, but the dream of owning every Japanese Saturn game Mm -hmm. has sort of always been there, you Mm. know? Mm-hmm. I'm not actively collecting, but I pick up stuff as I go if I don't already own it. Right, right. I get and that. It's, yeah. it. It's just, you know, it's one of those games where I just always wanted the Japanese version because it was a U.S. made game. It was very rare in Japan. And back when I was thinking about buying it, I didn't want to spend the 50 or $60 for it. Right. But of course, now it's two and three times that the last time I checked, it yeah. might even be more now. Could and be. yeah, uh, and I'll look at I'll look it up for you. <laughs> I'm gonna look it up right now while we're talking. Yeah, uh, let's see it, here. Yeah. eBay you got three. To, you can keep. Uh, so, OK. Ah, so three hundred dollars. Oh, three hundred dollars up. One hundred twenty or best offer. What's this? Oh, there, there you go. Yeah, there you go. 140, 120. Okay, so yeah, that one's 333.33. <laughs> it, it, it's all over the place, honestly. But I mean, here's one that's as low as 120. You gonna bite the bullet for 120? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can do 120. That isn't but that you, crazy. That really is, man. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I got out of collecting all those years ago. Is right, I just right. I, I just felt like I was spending more money on this stuff then I really wanted to. And then Mm. I was buying stuff that I knew I really didn't need stuff, stuff that I didn't have nostalgia for stuff that I was just collecting to collect, you know? And I really, I really got sick of doing that. So I sort of bowed out of collecting quite a bit. I even sold quite a bit of my collection, which I mean, the viewers, they're not going to be able to see, but you can see behind me. Sure, sure. I own a lot of Sega games, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, my, my Saturn collection is numbering close to a thousand now between my US and Japanese mm-hmm. games. My Sega Genesis collection is in the hundreds. Uh, my Sega CD collection is close to a hundred. I mean, I own a lot of games and I owned even more back then but i just decided you know what i need to back away from this and just buy the stuff that means something to me yeah and that that really helped man because it kind of put my passion back into it too Mm -hmm. because i had kind of turned it into it became more of materialistic kind of thing for me after a while sure yeah and and once i got away from that it became much more personal again and that really meant something. And that's sort of where I'm at today. I really only go after stuff that I really, really, really want. So let's talk complete set versus curated selection or personal collection. You know, right, so right. what is your philosophy then? You know, because because I imagine you have a complete U.S. set. Close. Close. OK. Yeah. So it's not all killer, no filler, though. I take it. you've got a lot of filler. <laughs> There's some filler in there for sure. (laughs) Okay. But I do, in my defense, I do own most of the big name titles for the U S sure. Sure. (laughs) But, uh, but, uh, but of course a lot of, like you said, a lot of those titles, you look at your shelf and you're like, I'm never going to play. I've got several games on my shelf right now that I'm looking at that. I'm probably not going to (laughs) play robo pit. There's one that I'm like thinking about like, okay, like see now if I had time, I could really sit down with that game and and, and probably get into it. But it, it's going to ask a lot of me. I'm going to have to forgive <laughs> a lot of things about that game in order to really like get the most enjoyment out of it. And I'm thinking, is that ever going to happen? Or should I just pass it along you know, <laughs> to somebody else who is willing to put in the effort? I don't know. Yeah. Honestly, the way I view collecting nowadays is this. If you started collecting 20 years ago or more, complete collections were realistic. Right. You know, they games were so much cheaper. You could go to a garage sale and pick up boxes of games. You could go to flea markets and get games for a couple of dollars and just buy them in bulk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So complete collections were very realistic then. 
my advice to anyone that is collecting now and just getting into it, complete collections are only for those of you that have money to burn. Right. Because that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to have to spend a ton of money well beyond what most people would consider reasonable. Um, so I would go with the personal collection, the curated collection. If you're looking to get into collecting today, man, sit down, write down the games that you are most interested in, price them out, find out how much they're going to you know, set you back. And then look at it from that type of strategy, because otherwise you're getting into something that most people are going to quickly find is well over their head in regards to price. Right, right. Another thing folks can do, if there's a specific genre or if there's a specific franchise that really makes you happy, you know, uh, sparks joy or whatever you want to say, like, let's say you want to collect every Sonic game. I think that's probably more doable. I mean, it's still going to get expensive at some point. There, there are some games that are rarer than others, but I mean, you yeah. could you could collect every Sonic game or you could collect every soccer awards game and and the soccer awards dreamcast if you wanted to you know and that's a really that's what i call a curated collection where you're like okay i'm focusing on collecting every sega arcade game or something like that that was ported you know every sega arcade port here you go it's the whole you know and then you've got personal collections which are just like all of the games that you personally have nostalgia for that you can yeah. still hold in your hands and say yeah i don't want to let go of this because this means something to me and again, yeah. you know, folks can say that that it's just plastic. Or it has no value. But that's kind of where I argue. It's like it really is to each their own. You know, what what does that mean to you? You know, um, if, if it has value and, you know, it, it brings you some joy. Great. If you hold it and you feel absolutely nothing, you feel dead inside, then you might want to consider giving it to somebody else, you know, who might enjoy it. Because, again, yeah. you know. Like I said, I feel nothing when I hold that copy of Robo Pit, except for, wow, this this box art is terrible. Yeah, exactly. You know? Well, you know, man, a lot of people will just tell tell you that, you know, it's materialism. You're sure. just trying you're trying to fill a hole in your life that can't be filled. You are a shallow person. Right. You are sad. You need friends. You know, I mean, they'll they'll psychoanalyze you and really put you down for collecting. Sure anything yeah. uh i can tell you there are games that i play today i only play them because of the experience that i had as a kid and they right. meant something to me you know i can remember me and my friend nathan and the other nathan and <laughs> you know nathan's brothers and our friend kurt would sit in the middle of the night and we would play wwf royal rumble on the super nintendo Nice. And we would play it hours into the morning, dude. And his mom and dad would get up and fuss at us for making too much noise. And man, those memories are priceless to me. Number one, because all of us separated after high school and we didn't stay in the same area. And number two, our friend Kurt passed away from cancer not too long after that. So these That's are right. memories with folks that meant something to me. They are memories with people that are no longer with us. They right. are memories that made you who the hell you are as a human being. Exactly. Yeah. And to say that, that it's materialism, that it's just plastic, that it doesn't mean anything, you know, to someone, these people know nothing. As a matter of fact, I would say that if you can honestly look at someone and say, that their memories that made them happy and, you know, connected them to their family and friends means nothing. Maybe they're the ones right. that have the problem. Oh, not sure. You. <laughs> well, obviously, because anything negative they're, they're spouting at you is coming from someplace. It's coming from someplace of jealousy or whatever, you know, their own, their own drama. But you're, you know, and 
I wouldn't say that they're completely wrong. So I would be humble enough to admit that those times that I mentioned to you where I'm chasing the high, you know, uh, those times where I'm just getting it to fill out the collection. And again, it's just something I scrolled through a list and was like, check that one, check that one, you know, (laughs) you know, and it's like, it's true. Okay. There is no nostalgia with some of those titles. I have no memories tied to some of those. And, and that's where I have to start stepping back and kind of like reevaluating my own collection saying, you know, Maybe it's time to let this one go because again, I've I've looked at it several times in the last year and never once pulled it off the shelf. But you're right; like they don't know the full story. And and multiple games on that shelf, I have very very specific vivid memories of either of with my little brother or my dad or my friends, you know, friends from high school and college and stuff like that. So yeah, um, and again, folks are just free to collect what they want, you know, collect stamps right. if you want, collect bugs. I don't care. But the point is, whatever it means to you, that you're the one who decides that, you know. So I mean, I guess that leads me into the next question is playing versus collecting. Mm. What say you? What's that? You're a content creator. So I imagine the only playing you get to do is for like video capture and stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, believe it or not, I actually still, the majority of my free time gaming is still retro gaming. Cool. You know, I will go back and I will play games that I really enjoyed or, you know, modern gaming has been actually slipping to the back burner for me for a really long time. Uh, When the PlayStation uh, 4 and Xbox One came out, that generation, I saw my modern game time really take a back seat Mm -hmm. to what I was doing with the older stuff. And it's not just the game captures. It's different because a game capture is radically different than from me playing a game because of course a lot of times when i game capture it's for some kind of review or opinion so i have to do something specific in the game i have to show you a specific animation or the weapons that are in the game or the power ups in the game i'm not playing that game for joy typically when i game capture i'm trying to show you the game which means I play it radically different than what I would otherwise. And it's always funny because I'll get people down in the comments, Sega Lord doesn't know how to play this game. His opinion doesn't matter. And And I'm just laughing like, dude, I'm trying to show you some of this stuff in the game. I'm not doing a speed run. Right. I'm not trying to beat this with one guy and I'm just providing commentary over it, dude. It's like I'm... I'm not doing that. I'm not playing this for joy. This is a review. This is what I'm breaking down to show you. So when and how do you find time to to play for, for fun? Mostly it's become something that I do with my family nowadays. Hmm. Uh, I have found that a lot of my gaming, I will pull back and focus on something that is multiplayer. Um. For instance, my wife and I play Diablo 2 and 3 regularly. Nice. We just pre-ordered Diablo 4 primarily because it is a multiplayer game that we can play together. We play we play the Lego games together. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, that has become a lot of my modern gaming and a lot of times I'll break out a game for my wife that's old that's multiplayer like i'll get her to play like streets of rage with me or something and you know a few years back i used to get my daughter to play co-op games with me a lot but then my daughter hit her teenage years man and of course my daughter hit her teenage years and now she doesn't want to have anything to do with anything that i'm doing (laughs) you gotta really prepare yourself for that man when your kids get to a certain age you become the uncoolest person in the room and they don't want anything to do with you. (laughs) (laughs) That was a joke, by the way. Oh, I understand. (laughs) Yeah. So let's see what, what should we, uh, we talked complete set versus curated selection playing versus collecting. Definitely. I try to make as much time as I can to play these games, you know, so you can still enjoy them. And you know, that's the whole point, right? Otherwise, uh, I mean, it's not the whole point for some oh, people. Yeah. Some people literally un, unashamed, unapologetically just are interested in collecting. You know, I like I don't want to throw shade at those people <laughs> like 
more power to them, I guess. But I mean, I, I also kind of feel conflicted because it is taking a copy away from the yeah. market. But then again, what does it matter what they do with it after they buy it? I mean, it's theirs, right? You know, so if they choose to put it on a shelf and never play it, yeah. I mean, all I can be is butthurt about it. But I mean, what good is that? You know, so folks are really free to do what they want to do uh, with their games. I'm hoping that they don't, you know, bury them or I don't know set fire to them <laughs> but you know that's just well you know man 20 years ago i was the kind of person that would sit on a discussion forum and argue until i was blue in the face whether a game was good or bad right whether something was worth owning and as i've gotten older i've just realized those kinds of value judgments are so utterly pointless right i mean you don't know these people you are it's never like yeah. yeah, you you're 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 likely never going to meet the people that you argue with incessantly online. I don't understand places like Twitter right. where people will just go for pages insulting one another for liking or disliking something or being part of some group that another group hates. Well, they have no life. (laughs) Yeah. And it's just like, it's just like people, do you have anything better to do with yourselves? Not really. You know, (laughs) but yeah, you know, you're, you're older, you've mellowed. Yeah. Cause yeah, like in my twenties, I was like, I I wouldn't say I was a gatekeeper, but I was definitely much more elitist about things. You know, you have to do it. You got to play it this way or you're not playing it oh you know or or like you know i used to be really really hard on folks for stretching their game their four by three games and now i'm just like yeah whatever i i'm not even gonna waste the breath exactly (laughs) to try to police that it's just whatever you want to do you know yeah and it's so ironic too because like we ended up doing the saturn lounge at prge right right and we have a room full of saturns i mean must have been like 25 Saturns hooked up. Right. And you just are never going to get that many CRTs. You know, they're, they're super heavy. They're super cumbersome. Right. You know, so as great as they are, they they gave us these Crosley LCDs, like Crosley is a cheap ass brand as you, as you may know. And I mean, these LCDs were like serviceable, right. But all of these Saturns were plugged in via composite. And I kind of just shook, I kind of just shook my head and said, you know, I've been like super elitist about, you know, video hookups and RGB and all that stuff. And here I am running a Saturn lounge where every machine is hooked up via composite uh, into like a Crosley LCD because we just had to get it done. Like we were like, we didn't have time. They, uh, we had like 25 of these Crosleys and they all matched. So the, the room looked uniform and I was just like, whatever, you know, like I, it kind of, I kind of had to laugh at myself, you know, (laughs) because I was like, for all the talking that I've done, you know, here we are running a room with everything hooked up that way. And I guess sometimes you just have to make compromises, you know, (laughs) you know, too, is that a lot of people just, the the varying amount of opinions out there you just have to realize that it's not worth it's just not worth arguing over i mean no i can't tell you how many times i've had someone tell me that a ossc is so much better than a frame meister or a red right. pink is so much better than this and they'll write half a page as to why you know, that's the case. And then I'll get that person that just says, oh, the HDMI adapter does me just fine. I'm happy with it. And you just realize, man, that there's just a swath of people out there that are going to feel the way they feel. And arguing with them is so utterly pointless. You know? Oh, yeah. And it's it's that way with whether you think a game is good or not, too. I mean, I don't care if you like a game that I you know, sure. don't and vice versa. I mean, you you, you got to grow out of that shit, man, or you never grow as a person. If, you, right. if you're 50 years old on the internet arguing with someone about a video game, <laughs> you got something to work on, you know? <laughs> Oh my gosh. But I mean, it, you live this stuff every day. You, you know, all these facts about Saturn stuff, right? And you get, then you go to like a, a convention like that where there's a bunch of average Joes, right? Maybe they're interested in PlayStation. Maybe they're interested in Nintendo. And a guy comes up to me, he's like, so whatever did happen to Sega anyway? And I'm just like, you're serious. <laughs> you gotta be, are you serious? <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I completely take for granted that people know what happened to Sega. <laughs> and this, this dude's asking me total with total sincerity. 
whatever did happen to Sega? Are they still around? And I'm just like shaking my head because everything bears repeating, I guess. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think just when I think I've, I've talked about Saturn too much or Knights too much, or I'll meet somebody who knows nothing about it. And I'm just like, are you kidding? I didn't realize there were still people out there that didn't know what happened to Sega. But oh, yeah. It's funny as you get older, you just kind of get more patience <laughs> for stuff, you know. Well, you know, if you, you have to, right? If you're a content creator, man, patience is absolutely a virtue, you know? Yep. I mean, I can't tell you how many times someone has said something to me in the comment section that just made me want to explode, you know, and just type out a wall of text telling why they're wrong and they're completely full of crap. And, you know, you just got to pull back and just, you know, do your thing in a polite and well-meaning manner. <laughs> right. And don't waste all of your words for that person. <laughs> exactly, man. Plus, you're a parent. So, you know, that's training for patients. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're absolutely right there. So uh, let's see here. We still got some things to touch on. So, OK, eBay versus offer up versus flea market versus garage sale <laughs> that's what i wrote here as my oh, as my note here so i mean let's go garage sale then do you ever remember buying stuff from garage sales oh yeah uh actually garage sales started a lot of my collection way back in 99 2000 i would hit up the garage sales and i had quite a bit of success and that of course the garage sales were sort of a first step to flea markets mm-hmm because I would do the garage sales locally, and then I would hit the flea markets up in places like Richmond. Richmond is the capital of Virginia, by the way. And, right. Or we would go to D.C., where there would be a lot of what they would call boot sales, where people were just, they'd pull up their car, their truck, and they would just sell stuff off of the back. And, you know, uh, I mean, back then you got games for next to nothing, you know, mm -hmm. you would just go up and people would be like, this is a dollar. This is two dollars. This is five dollars. You would pay really, really good prices for that stuff. And of course, all of that changed when social media came along, because I think mm -hmm. a lot of folks got turned on to flea markets by YouTubers who would talk about flea markets. And, right. You know, uh uh, Pat, uh, the NES punk, right. uh, started a series of videos, you know, Flea Market Madness, where that pretty much told everybody, go to a flea yeah. market, you can get stuff super cheap. And once more people started doing that, of course, flea markets became less of a place to go. Mm -hmm. Because those people that would go there, they, they started to understand that they had something of value. Right. And you it became a harder place to barter, to talk about a price and try to get it lower. Because like you say, people would just respond, I know what I have. Right. You know, and it would, it, it took away that element of getting a deal. Yeah. When I was younger, prior to kids and even prior to wife, right? you know, like I, my time was my own. I could go out, I could get there early, do all that stuff, you know, because you got to right. get there early, you, you know, and you see, so be competitive, you know? And now of course with a wife and kids and chores and things to, you know, bills to pay and stuff like that, you, you know, you got to consider everybody in the family. And so, you know, it's like, it's harder to do. I can't get there super early. So like the only thing that's left are those really sun damaged games, you know, at the, at the flea market, which I will never buy a sun damaged game. That's like, I have my limitations and I just, I don't even give a second look to sun damage, you know, cause that's, that's my limit. But, but yeah, Pat, he's from San Diego, just like me. And so I know exactly the flea markets that he goes to. And honestly, those are all dried up now, you know, right. at least if you ask me, you know, and if, if, if there is anything there, it's, you got to be getting there at the crack of dawn, you know, to, right. to even have it be worth your while. So yeah, those, the, the garage sales and the, and the flea markets are for, I, I would say the folks who are single who like can just, you know, get out there as early as possible and be competitive, you know? Right. And even even then, what's left there? What's left? Yeah. There, uh, is it even worth it anymore? You know? Right. No, it's not worth like the cover charge if you have to pay to get in. Right. Um, 
the, the, the garage sales now with gas being so incredibly expensive, you know, I mean, yeah. it's fluctuating, but still it's pretty expensive. So driving around garage sales doesn't sound appealing to me, considering that half the time I come home empty handed. Yeah. Um, you know, there are mom and pop shops, your odd video game store. Uh, I don't really do GameStop. Honestly, I haven't for years, you know, game crazy used to be a thing. I'm, I'm reaching back, you know, but game crazy was like a Hollywood video owned thing, you know, so there were game crazies. There's a few game stores in San Diego, Luna video games. Um, one other one, I can't remember the name, but I'm sure you have a game store, at least one yeah. in, in your neighborhood. Yeah, we have one. But again, like there's not many deals to be had, you know, they're barely making it, you know? So it's like, you don't want to ask them to come way down in price. Cause you know, that would be like basically taking out any kind of bottom line that they could make in order yeah. to sustain themselves. So it's like, there aren't any deals to be had there either. So then lots of folks turn to things like offer up or eBay for me, offer up has been pretty good. You know, like there's not as much selection as eBay, obviously, um, but with offer up, you know, you can get the odd deal, you know, if people are willing to work with you, I've gotten Neo Geo pocket color that way. Some good Neo Geo pocket games, a couple of Saturns I've gotten have been on offer up. Right. Yeah. So have you, do you have any experience with offer up, let go any of that stuff? No, not a lot. Bec- again, you know, take a look behind me, the games that I need in my collection or want in my collection at this point are rare probably. they're not only rare but they're the games that typically are crazy expensive i got you you know so if i honestly want to complete what i want in my collection pretty much the only place i have to go anymore is ebay you don't do yahoo auctions japan i mean i can but the stuff that i need is still crazy expensive. I got you. You know, I'm I'm not looking for fighting vipers for the Saturn. No. I'm I'm looking for a game that typically is going to be so rare that when you do find it on a Yahoo auctions, it's going to cost you and it's going to cost you no matter what. And like I said earlier, I've gotten kind of to the point where I don't want to spend crazy money mm. on these games anymore. So I've kind of pulled back from that kind of collecting. I just don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on video games anymore. Right. You know, and so you basically re- you've reached a, a kind of a stopping point. I sounds like pretty much I do buy the odd game here and there when I run across something that interests me. Right. Uh, give you an example. I recently did a Super Nintendo video where I talked about my least favorite games. And one of the games that I did in that episode was a Super FX game called Vortex. Right. And I had to emulate it because I didn't own it. I don't like the game, but I got to thinking all of those Super FX games I don't have a way of playing them on my Super Nintendo with my current setup if I don't own the original game. So I went out and I bought that game because it was cheap. It was like 15 bucks. So I'm pretty much down to purchases like that at this point Mm -hmm. where I just run across a curiosity that I want to add to my collection for one reason or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, like I recently bought Street Fighter Alpha 2 for my Super Nintendo because it has a special chip in the cartridge, which makes it so I just can't throw it on the EverDrive that I own right. and pop it in because, of course, the EverDrive that I own doesn't have the special chip in it, so I can't play it that right. way. Is it, there is an EverDrive that has FX support, right? Is there a new one? There is. Okay, yeah, okay. There is. But of course, I just own the regular Super Nintendo EverDrive. So, right. you know, I, you know, I don't have that option currently. So, pretty much I'm kind of at that point, man, and mm-hmm. I'm kind of at the point now where it comes to Sega games, I will buy the odd Game Gear or Master System game just because those are my smallest collections. Right. In terms of what I actually own. So when I run across a Master System game that maybe I haven't played in a while, it's kind of like, oh, this is actually not a bad game at all. Say like Batman Returns for the Master System. I'll go ahead and pick that up because it's not expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where my collecting is. I mean, I'm just not after 
you know, much anymore. And the stuff that I'm missing that I would like to own is so expensive that it's expensive everywhere, Prohibitive. no yeah. matter how, you know, no matter how deep I look or what service I use. I got gotcha. you. So, so, um, okay. So eBay is kind of the go-to, uh, because of, e- you know, it's easy to find at least when you are looking for something. And that tends to be this, the case for me as well too. You know I mean? It's like, at least you got the ratings. At least you can kind of like wait for a good deal to come up. And that's kind of what I will do is, you know, sir, have a lot of different eBay searches, you know, and then you get pinged and, you know, right. I mean, it, it, it's not great. It's, it's certainly not like it used to be in the old days, but I mean, it is definitely a serviceable option. You know, I think a lot of folks listening to this probably use eBay. Um, I'm curious what you think about reproductions and bootlegs. And it, do you even consider that collecting? I mean, you know, like that, that, cause that's another thing. It's like a lot of people ask, and it's a good question. Like if you're buying a bootleg, what's even the point? <laughs> like, like, cause it, it's not real. So it's like, is there any, is there any real point? I don't know. <laughs> you know, man, 20 years ago, if you had asked me that question, I would have given you a very elitist asshole answer. You know, I would have told you that people that collect reproductions are morons, you know, paying money for something that's fake is about the dumbest thing that you could do. Right. And, you know, 20 years later, I just don't feel that way anymore. Mm. I think in this climate with original games becoming so much more rare and so much more expensive, I feel a good reproduction is a good alternative if you want to own something that's affordable and still looks good. It still makes you feel good. It looks good on a shelf next to your collection. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that can be anything from, you know, you just like uniformity to your game room, to your entertainment center, to your... You know, people like their stuff to look good. It's no different than buying a pair of curtains that matches your couch in your living room. You know, it it really comes down to you just want something that looks good with what you enjoy doing. And in this case, people will buy reproductions to go with their collection. And if that's the reason they do it, what harm is that? I mean, they're not harming the aftermarket prices of games. No Panzer Dragoon Saga ever lost value because some asshole, you know, is selling bootlegs of it on Etsy, (laughs) you know? I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that reproductions are different. They're different for, you know, collecting purposes. If you're looking to collect the real thing, a reproduction is going to have no value to you. If you're looking to just own a game to play that is physical a reproduction could be fine. And if you want to play the game, you don't even need to own it physically. You know, you really do. That's the other thing. There are a lot of philosophical questions that you raise about, you know, like if you have emulation or if you have, uh, or if you have ODEs, you know, like what's the point if all you really want to do is play the game. Like, I'm definitely not a snob or an elitist when it comes to like folks doing whatever they want to do in order to play a game, to experience a game, right? You know, like I'm not going to tell anybody to go out and pay a thousand bucks for Panzer Dragoon Saga or even 50 bucks for a reproduction of Panzer Dragoon Saga. I'm going to tell them to get on the internet archive and download the sucker and just try it out, you know, try it out on an emulator first, you know, or uh, or on an ODE, you know, so you can experience the game. Sega's not making it. <laughs> They're not remaking it, you know. Um, I want folks to play the games, you know. I want and and so, you know, I don't I don't really care. You know, that that's my own take. And I realize that everybody kind of feels different about it, but and I if, if there's a genuine opportunity for you to support Sega uh, as a company, that's great. You know, like uh, they're re-releasing Saturn games on the Switch. I haven't bought any personally uh, because I own all of those same games on the Saturn and they run much better on, on a real Saturn. But not everybody has real Saturn hardware. Do I still think that they're worthwhile experiences and that people should own them and play them? Yeah, I do. So, you know, Radiant Silver Gun comes out on the Switch and you can't afford that game on the Saturn, I think, yeah, yeah, buy it on the Switch, and then that way you can actually support the company and play the game, you know? But I mean, yeah, when it comes to, like, reproductions and bootlegs, 
everybody's kind of got to decide for themselves. I kind of think, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it really just comes down to what you want. If you want the tactile feel of owning a disc, even if it's a reproduction, that's completely up to you. Why does someone have to apply a value proposition to it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like just because they don't think that it's worth anything, it, it may mean something to you. You may just like having a collection of physical games on your shelf. It doesn't matter to those people whether they're real or not. And in some cases, I'm actually seeing people making their own games where they make custom disc they make custom instruction manuals. Mm -hmm. They make custom art. Mm -hmm. I mean, you yourself, uh, you know, are well aware when you add a custom element to a reproduction, it can be something worth owning. Right. You know, and I mean, I don't know, man, I I'm well past judging people for what makes them happy. Mm -hmm. If, if a reproduction makes you happy, go for it. If emulation makes you happy, go for it. If a crappy switch port makes you happy, you go right ahead and play the heck out mm -hmm. of it. That's really how I feel. Man. Right. One thing though, uh, you can't deny is that, that all these reproductions have been born out of this market. That's going crazy. You know, the, the Saturn market is oh, gone. Yeah. And, it, and this is a consequence. This is a side effect, a, unintended consequence, I guess you could say, is that you now have all these reproductions, uh, all the, you know, bootlegs or reproductions, whatever you want to call it, um, because folks can't afford to get the real stuff, you know I mean? And that's, yeah. that's where we're at. You know, if it was cheaper, I'm sure a lot of folks would go out and buy the real thing if they, if they could pay 20 or, or 30, maybe even 40 bucks for some of these like good games but no instead you know they end up getting a reproduction of it because they really want the game like you said um do you have any reproductions and and do you like reproductions i have a number of reproductions uh i've got the ones that you gave me mm -hmm. which are some of the finest reproductions i've ever seen by the way so good job there man thanks um i've got a few dreamcast reproductions that i've collected over the years um, but when it comes to reproductions, the only real time I go after anything anymore mm -hmm. is when I'm trying to complete a game that I have that is incomplete. Right. Uh, for instance, I had some Saturn games that are us Saturn games that didn't have the back inserts right. for the long box. I got you. Okay. So instead of tracking down the originals and paying a fortune for them, I just bought high quality you know, reproductions of, Inserts. Yeah. of the insert and cool. it completed the game for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've done this with a couple of my Sega Genesis games as well, because back in 1994, Sega switched from the awesome plastic clamshells yep. to the cardboard boxes for their Sega Genesis games. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Yeah. And man, I hate those cardboard boxes. So when I started collecting, I actually bought the cardboard box games cartridge only. And I found somebody that made cardboard boxes and I bought new, uh, I mean, I made insert inserts for the clamshells of those cardboard box games. Yes. Yeah. And I made them clamshell nice. games, nice. you know? And yeah, so, I refuse to even buy those cardboard boxes. Like oh. I don't I, I think the only Genesis games I own are the clamshell ones because I just can't stand to look at those oh. cardboard boxes, those shabby, they're all dilapidated, you know. Oh yeah. It's terrible. Uh but, but no, good on you. Good on you for turning those into clamshell games. That's a good idea. Hell yeah, man. I turned them into clamshells. I you know, threw the instruction manuals over in them and I was good to go. So yeah, um, that's pretty much where I am with the reproductions. I kind of just finish up games yeah. that I have that aren't complete. So that's pretty much what I use reproductions for. Cool. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's valid too. So, and I'm sure that a lot of folks can probably relate to that using it to just kind of complete a game that's incomplete. Yeah. Um, so how do you feel about uh, physical versus digital? 
I know this is a huge can of worms topic, but face it, we must because it's literally like pounding at our door. Like I, all of the Switch games that I've bought and I've bought them all physical, you know, I kind of look at it and I'm like, oh my God, like when they shut off those servers, the, every single one of those games is going to be gimped <laughs> and everything beyond that, forget it. It's just basically day one installation media, <laughs> but, right? You know, so that, that's the thing that really makes me sad. Is uh, I was just listening to Pat and Ian on their podcast, and they were talking about how it's being confirmed that Nintendo Switch, like sixty percent of their audience is digital, sixty percent of their sales are digital. So it's it the tables flipped from it being physical over digital. Now it's it's definitely digital over physical, you know, and. Uh, yeah. What that brings with it. So, I mean, you mentioned that you're pretty much mostly focusing on, you got everything you, you want. You mostly focus on retro gaming. Um, what thoughts do you have left on, you know, physical versus digital? Do you do any, do you buy digital games at all? Uh, I only buy digital games for stuff that is online enabled only anyway. Mm. So, you know, I mentioned previously that I bought Diablo 2. I played Diablo three. I just pre-ordered Diablo four. Those games are, they're server based. They have to connect to the internet for you to play them. Mm -hmm. I will buy those games digitally because I know that when they switch those servers off, you're not going to be able to play that game anymore. Anyhow, you know, so as far as games like that, I will buy digital versions for them, but most of the time, I'm like you. I will still try to buy a physical version of a game. Mm. I got to be honest with you, though. I think there's more to the digital and physical argument than a lot of people understand or really see the long term ramifications for. Because talking about ownership, not just ownership, but the backlash that these companies are going to see. When someone's digital library ceases to exist. Let me give you an example. Most people that owned an Xbox One, all of their games moved over to the Xbox Series X when it came out. Most of the PlayStation 4 games that were available moved over to the PlayStation 5 when it came out. These digital audiences have been able to move their digital purchases for the last, what, 10 years? For the last decade? What's going to happen when the next Nintendo, the next Sony machine, the next Microsoft machine breaks that compatibility line and nothing before that no longer is playable on the new machine? I think that these game makers are playing with fire because the first company that breaks that line of compatibility right now that there has been a switch to digital, it mattered way less during the Xbox 360 and PlayStation three days, I think because people were still mostly physical back then. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it mattered as much, but I think with more people going digital nowadays, I think these companies are going to have to continue that line of compatibility and the company that has the balls to break it. I think they are going to be met with a huge backlash, man. As soon as someone loses their three, four, five hundred dollar game library and can't play it on the new system, boy, that's going to spark outrage online and i think the company that does that is going to be a company that is in real trouble hmm. with a with a new machine um i don't blame people for going digital i understand it you don't want a stack of games sitting around mm -hmm. i can kind of see why you would want to do that and there's just this ease of use with it don't want to leave the house i mean covid <laughs> you know that, that, that there's a lot of reasons it's fine my, my nine-year-old son doesn't get it he, he looks at all the boxes because like for me, it's like I want that shelf with all the boxes on it. You know, right. I want the games. I want, of course, we don't even get a manual with Nintendo Switch games anymore, but you at yeah. least get the insert art and you get the cartridge. Um, but it's like he just sees it as an inconvenience. He's like, I just want to switch games really quick. I have to take out the thing and put it in this, you know, and so it's like so funny how 
because I grew up with physical media because I grew up with analog cassettes and stuff. Uh, right. I grew up with the, the ritual of blowing on a game and putting it in a cartridge, you know, um, to me, that's normal. That is what normal is when it comes to games. And I want to own a physical copy of a game on a shelf. My son could care less. Like if, if I asked him, he'd just be like, just give it to me now. <laughs> Why? It's right here on the eShop. Why can't we buy it? It was like, because this is my switch and, and I don't want to buy digital games that I don't really own, you know, but again, it's all an illusion because I don't really own the games that are on the cart either. If I, you know, if they shut off the servers and essentially I own a broken game, you know, oh, I mean, yeah. I feel, so, you know, they're going to patch the hell out of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Uh, and anybody who has like that original cart just essentially has a really barked game, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's going to be the way it is going forward. I mean, without the patches, without the updates, you know, just having a day one, you know, install of a game isn't really all that great anymore either. So right. I don't know, man, there's an illusion there that definitely exists, but I, I, th I think the companies that are relying on digital content, they've got a firestorm coming their way when they break the compatibility with this, with these libraries that people are building, man. And I've seen mm -hmm. people, with hundreds and hundreds of digital games that they've bought the last 10 years on their PlayStation 4 and Xbox Ones. And I don't know. I, I think the first company that, that that breaks that line, they are absolutely in for a, a, a hell of a thrashing on the internet when they do that. And I got a feeling Nintendo is going to be the first company to do it. So we'll see. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. They're the they're the same ones that have had a console out since what 2016, and they haven't lowered the price of their games yeah. <laughs> at all. And a, and a pro controller still costs eighty bucks. It's kind of like Apple was with the with the iPhones or or the iPods. You know, it's like nope, we're you know it's been five years. We're not lowering the price one iota. You know, oh, no. it's crazy. But I mean, I think you're right. I think Nintendo will be the ones to do it. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're banking on this generation to not care. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they, it'll be a different uh, dynamic, a different. Uh, I, I don't know, because, again, like folks like you and I, we care for sure. And, and we definitely feel that sense of outrage if we can't move our games forward. I mean, we came from a generation of backwards compatibility. That was just like a selling point with us, you know, with our generation, you know, and you got used to it. And anytime there wasn't, I mean, it, like take the Saturn, for example, <laughs> where a lot of folks thought it would have backwards compatibility because, you know, Sega had done that before, you know, and then they didn't have it. There was backlash. There was definitely, you know, a sense of, you know, well, what are we going to do with all these Genesis and Sega CD games? You can't play them on the Saturn, you know? You know, to tell you the truth, that's one of the dumbest things Sega ever did was not making the Sega Saturn backwards compatible with the Genesis, man. Seriously. It had the Motorola chip in it. I was like, like, how, mu how much harder would it have been, you know? That's what, that's what I argue all the time. It's like, look, the Saturn already had a 68,000 in it. All it needed was a cartridge adapter that had the graphics and sound chip on it that slapped into that Saturn cartridge slot and they could have sold it for 30 bucks at that point because the Genesis, they had already shrunk the Genesis down into basically one freaking chip anyway. Basically. And they already had the cart. They already had Sega CD using Genesis carts for backup memory, right? <laughs> yeah. So they it could have been a dual purpose. You know, they could have kept using those same backup memory carts with just a little bit of a bigger RAM chip on, on there, you know, so they wouldn't have had to retool and make a whole new cart standard, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I, okay. Different topic, yeah. but definitely. That, that like, one's next time, man. That one's next time. Yes, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, okay. My last question for you is uh, magazines and print material. Do you, do you collect? I do not collect, but I do own quite a few. Okay. Um, when I was growing up, I was, uh, of course, big into gaming magazines. I mean, Gaming magazines is pretty much how I discovered import gaming 
because as you remember back in the early 90s, these import shops that would be in San Diego, San Francisco, you know, Seattle, New York, they would advertise in gaming mag- magazines and you know, that's kind of where I discovered them at, you know, it's like you discover them, you call them up. What do you have? When is this coming out? Oh, that's cool. I would like to buy that. And that's really where I started. And I own electronic, I own quite a few electronic gaming monthlies, Game Pro, Next Generation. Um, I still have my Next Generation number one that's got Virtua Fighter on the cover. Nice. With, with the little foil, you yep. know, first episode. Collector's edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. And, you know, I still remember buying that freaking magazine, man. You know, it was kind of like, oh, my God, Next Generation. So you bought that when it was new? Oh, yeah. Still own you- the same one. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, my magazine collection, it's not huge because a mm. lot of them I've lost over the years when I stopped paying attention to them for a while mm-hmm. I lost some in a move. Some of them mm-hmm. got damaged, but you know, I still own some really good ones and I have thought about starting, starting to collect them again, but I've noticed too that the prices of those suckers are going up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and people didn't save those nearly as much as they did games. You know? Oh, <laughs> so they didn't. It's like, yeah, I, I'm definitely feeling the hurt because I do collect uh, gaming magazines. Same. You know, I came up reading gaming magazines. So, uh, especially some of the, you know, I have a, I have the entire first three years of Next Generation, which is a, fount of information you know like it's very much at the time you know raw it, you know information as it was happening on the ground you know it was the grown-up uh, magazine and and every issue it changed you know you'd have a story that would change every issue because they were just get they were reporting on it as they got the information in you know so it was really right. fascinating uh you know of course sega saturn magazine uh had to pay a pretty penny for that uh importing that from the uk but it was worth it because it was a phenomenal mag uh and that kind of stuff Curi- uh, you, do you do standees or anything like that i i don't personally but i know pat does a few of my friends uh, do the standees or brochures other other kind of stuff no no i never got into any of that stuff man you got a lot of nice, pretty boxes, though, behind you, <laughs> like complete oh, boxes. Oh, yeah. I own a lot of complete video games and systems. Uh, for the longest time, what I got into the most in terms of speciality was is I just got into collecting hardware. Right. Game controllers, peripherals, you know, add-ons, uh, different variations of console hardware. Mm. You know, You know, as you know, the Saturn had a, you know, for a... For a system that's considered a failure, it sure does have a lot of variations, doesn't it? Oh, hell yeah. And a lot of uh, accessories as well. Yeah, it really does. And uh, I find myself, you know, attracted to that Mm. more than any of the like, you know, demo systems. I know people love demo systems. You know, right. they, they remember standing there as a kid, you know, yeah, yeah. pounding away on the half working controller. But yeah, uh, it, it's mostly hardware, accessories and controllers that I cool. focus on as a speciality, man. Uh, I'm always whenever I walk into a store, I'm like looking for, you know, hardware. Mostly uh, I went up to um, there's a game store in D.C. that I can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, it's a big game store up there. And I always go up there. And pretty much the only reason I go in there anymore is to look for the controllers because mm. there's always some controller out of the blue that I've never seen before. And I'm always interested in that because, you know, uh, so many third parties made so many controllers and some of them are good and some of them are terrible and, you know, it, it's it's just interesting to see that kind of stuff. And that's kind of, you know, hmm. what I look at nowadays. What would you say is your favorite uh, third party Saturn controller, either like an accessory or peripheral? Uh, I would probably go with the Hori arcade stick. Mm. The, the black, SS? Yeah, the black one the fight, with the yeah. green buttons. Right. Uh, as far as third party controllers, man that's probably the best made one that I've found. Mm -hmm. Um, I I mean, if, if you're talking about just pad and, you know, just a smaller controller, um, Mm. I really liked the, uh, 
uh, Bomberman controllers that had the turbo switches on them. Yeah, the S Bomber one. Yeah, yeah, those were really cool. If you can find one that hasn't been beaten up or had the, you know, the buttons worn to hell on them, those are actually decent controllers as well. They are. Yeah. yeah. And they look cool too. Yeah, they really you do. Get, you get those with the, with the multi tap. Those are kind of pricey though. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> to, know, like, like everything else. <laughs> well, you know, back when I paid, bought, uh, back when I got mine, I think I paid $10 for them and I nice. own two or three of them. Um, I do like the virtuous, uh, fighter sticks that came out from, uh, you know, the three and four button ones, the ones that were made right. for VF one and two. And then there was that special one that was made for fighters. Mega mix. Those but, are like the smaller black sticks. Right. Um, right. They're really well, they're pretty well made too. And uh, I mean, as far as Saturn arcade controllers, there's a few good ones out there. The one Sega made wasn't all that great. I mean, uh, the one that came out here in the U S of course, the one, the one that was designed after their arcade machines, that one was really good. But, you know, the consumer level one that we got here in the U.S., I can't remember what the hell the number of that one was, but mm-hmm. um, that one wasn't particularly good. But um, I find myself playing with the analog controller more than anything here lately, just because it works with all of the racing games pretty much. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, the analog controller is great for... The racing games, Deep Fear, uh, it works well on uh, nights, obviously. Um, quite, a, quite a few things. Yeah, um, actually, uh, the next time you fire up Soviet Strike. Soviet pl- Strike, yeah. Play it with the analog yeah. pad, man. It plays so much better with the analog pad. That's a, actually a really great looking game, too. Like, they really put in the production value into Soviet Strike. Yeah. I was just amazed at the FMV, the the music, the everything about that game. Very much uh, underrated, I think. I don't really hear a lot of people talking about Soviet Strike. But uh, yeah, um, Croc as well. You know, honestly, I know it's not a great game, but it <laughs> controls better with the 3D control pad. And yeah. I, I discovered recently that they actually programmed uh, different sensitivity options into the menu. So you can crank the sensitivity way down and then use the analog control pad. It becomes much easier to control him. He it, he moves in much smaller increments that are just much more manageable. So I, rec- I I've been recommending that to folks is give that a shot. Dial dial the sensitivity down to like one or two and then try it with the analog controller. It does become a lot more controllable. Yeah. Um, I think we've touched on everything. Uh, I guess we should uh, end with giving people advice about Saturn Collect. I mean, well, you already did say, you know, folks should really aim for, you know, whatever games that they have fond memories of rather than trying to go for a complete set because that's the complete set as a thing. It's just, it's gone. You know, that was a thing of the past that people used to do. And then other people would go for the complete set because other people did it, you know, but they did it in under the right conditions, you know, back when it was a perfect storm. Yeah. I, just, if you're going after a complete collection nowadays, you're either unrealistic or you are independently wealthy. <laughs> yeah. I think you should just pick out the games that mean the most to you and then fill out everything else with like an ODE. Like you got a satiator, right? Yeah. Were you ever able to like figure out the you were having oh, issues just like I was, right? Man, that thing. <laughs> I've never wasted so much time on a device in my entire life than I did with that thing. Is that right? Uh, yeah, quick story. I bought that thing when it very first came out, was super excited for it. I got it. I intended to review it on my channel. I had all kinds of problems with it. Games with messed up sound, games locking up and, you know, crashing. I mean, it was driving me insane. I went through a dozen different uh, memory cards Mm -hmm. was having varying levels of success. I would think I would find a memory card that would work, and then I would run into a game that would simply not work. Right. And it drove me crazy to the point where I actually stopped using it. Hmm. And then there was a firmware update for it, and someone that I knew online recommended a certain brand of memory card for it. And he said, try this. So I did. 
And for the most part, since the satiator has been working out for me, but good God, man, there for the first few months of owning that thing, I just wanted to throw it against the wall. Yeah. You and I were in the same boat because it, uh, Pat and Nick got theirs. So we all got ours day one. You, right. uh, you like as soon as it got, you know, we, we all ordered ours, right? Right. We're going to write about it. We're going to report on it, whatever. Uh, and Nick and Pat, they had no problems pretty much smooth sailing from the get go. You and I it was just constant issues, right? Lockups, right. black screens. And, and oftentimes the issues that you would have would be inconsistent. So it was like, right. you couldn't even troubleshoot it because it was like, okay, wait a second. It was working. Okay, wait a second. Now it's now it's rebooting or it's doing a black screen, but it was the the behavior was so inconsistent, right? Absolutely. You know, and it, it, for for me, it just ended up being the 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 card. So I didn't get like an adapter, you know, like a micro SD with an adapter. I got a dedicated SD card. It was like a Samsung Pro two hundred fifty six gigabyte card. And once I got that and you know got the formatting on there, and then just copied the entire collection over at once instead of doing dragging and dropping like little things on there it was just working fine for me after that but yeah like i remember talking to you about that and it was like upsetting me as well because i was like what's wrong <laughs> like everybody else is saying oh it's fine it's not it's not the satiator it's you <laughs> and i was like well i'm not doing anything that you guys are not doing yeah so it was it was yeah. crazy but yeah actually this right here is a hitachi high saturn this is what i use to uh capture my game footage for on my channel nice and inside this little guy is a satiator right and the only memory card that I could find that worked in this thing was okay. a SanDisk Extreme. Okay, SanDisk Extreme. This was the only memory card that I tried that would work. And I don't buy cheap media, man. I buy good media. You mm -hmm. know, I buy name brand media that of comes, course, yeah. you know, that works in everything that I've ever <clears throat> used before. The satiator was so incredibly picky. I could only find and get this to work. Hmm. And this drove me crazy because I've got high quality equipment all over my house, loaded with memory cards that work perfectly. Mm -hmm. This was the only one that I could get to work <laughs> in the satiator. I'm curious. So did, did you, and you tried formatting fat 32 as well as X fat and all that, bro, every <laughs> single thing you could try. I tried with this thing. It, it, okay. it, it's like you said, man, it was so inconsistent. My only conclusion can be that satiators are not all the same. It sounds like we got units. They were fickle. They potentially with bad edge connectors maybe on the on the sd card that's what i'm that's what i keep thinking is like maybe we got ones where there's a pin that's just like has a bad connection on the edge connector yeah i don't uh, because, know i don't know but i don't know but obviously like, like obviously other people haven't had problems but yeah no i mean so since a year ago since since i got my issues sorted out i have to say it's been smooth sailing and i mean we even went to a con and, and ran a convention with like I think we had like five satiators there. And so we used them definitely. De they came in handy, you know, cause it's like you needed a, you needed a system that was dedicated to whatever homebrew. Okay. Toss a satiator in there. You're done. You know? So, so that, that I will say is, you know, they definitely came in handy for that, but yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the Fenrir, I kind of tell folks, you know, they should definitely take a look at the Fenrir because there's a ton of uh, potential with that. And also it's good for the price, you know, uh, high compatibility, well built. Now there's a new one that basically supports both 21 pin and 20 pin. And so it's like it's got that Wi-Fi module on there as well that hopefully will support um, booting off of a NAS, you know. So right. um, that's definitely it's like going to be ODEs are really going to be what cracks the Saturn library open for a lot of folks, you know, in terms of actually playing the games, you know. Actually, if you really think about it, when we sit here and we talk about Saturn collecting, I don't even think I would point someone to physical media for Saturn anymore right. in this day and age, yeah. man. When it really comes down to it, the recommendation should be you really just should find an ODE and 
and get your games that way. It, in the long run, you're going to save a fortune doing mm-hmm. it that way. I mean, unless you are absolutely dead set on physical media, right? You know, a Terra Onion mode, a right. you know device, whatever company you want to support or don't want to support. However, that that goes for you. Right. You know, I mean, buy the product that is most attractive to you. Yeah, I have, I've got a mode in, in, in my Dreamcast. That thing works great. Oh, yeah. I, I, I had it in my Saturn for a while, but uh, but I wasn't having too much luck with homebrew with, with the mode. Uh, I was having, I was running a lot of, a lot of problems with the homebrew uh, when it came to the mode, but I put it in my Dreamcast and it's just been beautiful. Like, so that's, that's what I do you know, with my Dreamcast now. It's so funny that, that, you know, you had trouble with the satiator. I had trouble with the satiator. My mode ended up in my Dreamcast. Your mode <laughs> ended up in your Dreamcast. Yeah. You know? Well, now I don't have to listen to that drive, that Dreamcast drive grinding away the way that it was, you know? Oh, and yeah. And the last yeah. thing I streamed uh, some Machin' X on my Dreamcast, and the drive was just like, and it was taking forever to load the, and I'm like, okay, tomorrow I'm putting the mode in my Dreamcast and calling it done. And I mean, it's, it's great. Now I got a WD blue in there, SATA, you know, and it's super fast. So it loads everything super fast. I love it. Pretty much the same. I dropped a hard drive into mine, into my Dreamcast, and now I don't have to listen to the drive. I got a Noxua fan put in there so that you can't hear the fan anymore. You know, and you can get one of those uh, emulated VMUs that, that that has like tons of memory. You know, you pop, pop an SD card in it, then you don't have to listen to that beep every time you turn on your Dreamcast. Oh, you know, man. yeah, you get so sick of that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I I mean, I guess the kind of people who are going to be collecting now, God, you got to be crazy. To I, I'm trying to think what kind of person looks at the market and says, yeah, you know, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to throw countless dollars away. But I mean, more power to you if you decide to do that. Just realize what you're getting yourself into is like you happen to be getting in on the on it at one of the worst times ever, you know. But I mean, worst times I ever. thought the same thing back in 2015 when I got back into it. I was just like, well, the market looks pretty sad, but here I go. <laughs> Wish me luck. And now I've got like yeah. close to a full U.S. set. So there you go. Well, you know, if somebody did want a physical collection, the only thing I could tell them at this point is just point them towards the Japanese games. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Japanese games have remained relatively affordable for many of them. Now, that doesn't mean you aren't going to run into some that cost a fortune, but you can still collect quite a few really good Japanese games that don't really break the bank. So if you're looking into Saturn collecting into in you know 2023, visit the Japanese market and look at the games that are available there. You're probably going to find more there that are affordable versus mm-hmm. you know a pow collection or a u.s collection so yeah yeah i mean going into a pow or u.s collection in this day and age you know you're in for you're in for right. a lot of you know wallet hurting <laughs> but if it's a, if there's a specific game out there that you you really want to own for example i love snatcher you know and so it's a it's a game that I, it's like i don't need to have every Sega CD game, but that's one game that it's like, I just love that game so much. Right. You know? So if, if there's something like that, you know, don't be afraid to test drive it on an emulator. You know, there are several emulators that work. All you need is a a modest PC to do the job and you can test out these games and kind of see if you like it enough that you really want to take the plunge and say, okay, I like it $300 worth. You know, I've got the money and you want to spend it on a physical copy you can put on your shelf. If, if it means that much to you, go for it. You know, it's just know what you're getting yourself into and don't just be throwing your money out after a bunch of like random games just to fill out a, a complete collection. <laughs> Cause I think yeah. trying to do that now is just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Actually on that note, this is something that a lot of people really misunderstand or, I mean, I don't know if it's willful or if it's just lack of experience, but Saturn emulation stopped being difficult 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of people don't understand. It doesn't take anything to run Saturn emulation anymore. 
Saturn no. emulation was tough in 2005. Right. You know, um, you can emulate the Saturn on point with something as old as SSF yeah. on a laptop that's a decade old at this point. You know, you don't need a lot to emulate the Saturn anymore. Right. It may not be like cycle accurate or anything, but but it's like you're not going to know the difference. SSF is a great resource for like taking screenshots, honestly, it, you it know, is. do it. That, that's one way that Peter still does, you know, for, for the website, you know, he's fired up an SSF, takes several screenshots uh, and then they're all the same format. They're all that like 320 by 224 uh, fits nice in a bunch of galleries and stuff. It's a great, great resource. And folks should need to realize that it's like, that's a myth that's long since been busted. Busted, <laughs> you know? man. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's something that actually a lot of people don't realize too, is, is that Saturn emulation has gotten so good that it has actually improved the original games. Oh, sure. Uh, the upscaling. You, yeah. You can take something like Mednafin and, you know, you can fix the transparencies. You can run them in higher resolutions, even on something as old as SSF. You can play a game like Dracula X Nocturne in the Moonlight and it removes almost all of the slowdown in that game. So it plays just like the PlayStation version. Exactly. You, you know, I mean, emulation of the Saturn has gotten to the point where you don't have to buy original hardware if that's going to be a monetary issue for you. Just download a freaking emulator and try the games out and see if you like them. Emulation right. is easy. I mean, there's even front ends now that make the emulation easier than it used to be years ago. Definitely. So, yeah, you know, uh, don't be afraid to, you know, investigate that yeah. stuff and try it out if you do though happen to have the nostalgia bug for the hardware itself and you want to hold that saturn controller i highly recommend folks get one now i mean they're just going up in price you know that unfortunately we've seen the consoles just go from 40 to 60 to 80 100 120 for a console you know and yeah. it's like it may not even come with any games with it so it's crazy like and people continue to ask crazy prices for these consoles. So they continue to kind of the market continues to kind of trend upwards like that. So if you guys are thinking about getting a Saturn, definitely grab one now, you know, get it with a controller. If you can, if you happen to get a 3D control pad, consider yourself lucky because those themselves go for between 60 to $80. And I mean, that's out of the box. You know, <laughs> if you want it in the box, forget it. It's like uh, 120 or something. Yeah. in the box yeah it goes so, way up <laughs> yeah so i mean essentially grab yourself a saturn and an ode and uh you get to playing some games or or even a pseudo kai cart you know and burn yourself some cds while cdrs are still available because how who knows how long those will continue to be pressed you know right. uh again it's a obsolete media format technically you know actually on that note grabbing an original system i gotta ask you last question okay crt or modern solution crt or, mo or uh, well okay so, uh, for me it's crt and i mean that's that's how i do, but but i don't fault anybody going modern as long as they have a good way to get it into their into their modern solution i mean actually let me take that back do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> if you want to play, <laughs> if you want to plug in via composite, um, there's a lot of TVs out there actually like Sony TVs and stuff that are actually really good. Now they have, they have better internal components than we did with like the XRGB 10 years ago, you know? So it's like a lot because technology just keeps moving forward. Right. And a lot of these TVs have kind of gotten wise to, so you can get a good TV. You just have to know what one to buy, yeah. you know, get on an online forum and ask. And and there are TVs that do a pretty good job of accepting composite component S video. Well, I don't, they may not have S video in, but, but um, if you get a retro tink, even like a tink two X or um, what was it? The rad two X, you know, which is just like a bespoke sat. It goes into the back right. of your Saturn plugs right. into HDMI. Those things look amazing. And I mean that, that, that'll do the trick right there. Uh, if you happen to be on an LCD or an OLED. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, and again, like if, if level hike or you want to, you want to get one of those, uh, you know, cheap HDMI solutions, I would never do it. But if you want to, that's totally fine. I'm not going to sit here and gatekeep and tell you that you can't play your Saturn whatever way you want to. <laughs> but 
But if you get to the point where you're doing combos in Street Fighter Alpha or whatever, and you're noticing that there's lag and that it's just not quite how you remember, don't blame the game. <laughs> Take a second and think, maybe I'm not actually playing this the way that I used to when I was five or seven years old, because you used to play it through composite in a CRT, you know, and that will give you completely lag free gameplay, you know, so even if you can source a cheap, you know, 20 to $40 Sony, uh, Trinitron, you know, on offer up or on, uh, your local Craigslist or whatever, or maybe some, somebody, you know, is giving one away, try that, you know, plug your Saturn into that via composite and you will notice that, it's, it is what you remember, you know, that's the, that's the only problem I have is when people say, Oh, the, you know, this game doesn't play as good as I remember it. <laughs> like, I think you're not playing it how you remember it, <laughs> you know, there's some truth to that, man. Um, you know, I've really adopted the, you know, live and let live when it comes to sure. display devices. You know, I try not to be too judgmental. I mean, uh, the, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is, is that I think genre really matters with the device that you use. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of people out there will tell you and swear up and down that a level hike HDMI adapter on their Saturn is perfectly fine, looks fantastic, and they notice no lag whatsoever. Hmm. And then you talk to them a little bit and you realize... They're playing adventure games. They're playing RPGs. They're playing, right. They're playing the type of games where Twitch gameplay doesn't really come doesn't into. Doesn't really matter. Yeah. yeah. So you really have to understand that everybody's setup and preference and what they're playing tends to differ incredibly person to person. Sure. And you know, if you're a Street Fighter guy or you're a bullet hell shoot 'em up guy you're probably going to want a CRT or you're going to mm -hmm. want a really good, you know, modern solution, like say the uh, retro tink five X or something, you right. know, you know, you're going to want to hook that up to a low lag, you know, OLED for the best image, you know, yeah. you're, you're going to want to educate yourself a little bit if you're sure. in those particular genres. But I mean, you go I mean, you don't even have to go that far though. Sure. If, if you spare no expense, if money is no object, then yeah, I'm going to tell folks get a, get a Tink 5X. Right. Right. Um, but you don't even have to do that anymore. Uh, Retro Tink, they have cheaper solutions that work just fine yeah. um, and work better than the level hike, maybe for like 10 or $20 more yeah, that's the than rad, the level hike. That's the Rad 2X you were talking the about. The Rad 2X, exactly, exactly. And it, and and it's it's going to be great, you know? Yeah. So you get a game like, uh, you get a game like um, Mega Mix that runs in the quote unquote high resolution mode. It's interlaced, right? You know, right. and the, that's where the level hike doesn't really handle that interlace too well, you know? Yeah. And you notice it. You definitely notice it. Um, I can definitely understand what you mean though, for a game like mist or something like that, that runs in the low resolution and it's just static images, you know? So yeah. the level hike for like a title screen, you can't really tell the difference. It's cause it's pretty much a static image, right? You know? Yeah. Well, you so, know, there's, there's actually a, a number of games you can play with a level hike and you're just not going to notice it. Not much of a difference. It's not going to affect the gameplay terribly you know you're going to play something like magic knight ray earth or yeah. something like dragon force where you're not you know mm -hmm. moving around a sprite on the screen lightning fast dodging bullets or incoming you know combo attacks you know games like that are going to be much more forgiving on a cheaper device like a level hike you know right but like you say when the level hike came out man there wasn't a rad 2x you know, the mm -hmm. Rad 2X came out a little, a little bit after the level hike. So yeah. when the level hike came out, I can kind of understand why people gravitated towards it because it was an inexpensive solution. But exactly. you are absolutely right. There are still inexpensive solutions to getting a Saturn on a modern display that really don't cost a ton more. 10 or 20 bucks and you'll get a better mm -hmm. image. You'll get less latency and you'll get a better overall gaming experience by, mm -hmm. you know, going that route. And I think that people people who want to go go to the lengths of working the Saturn into their living room setup 
you know, are probably going to shell out a little bit extra money to get it looking great on their OLED or LCD. Yeah. But folks who are really just about experiencing it the way they remember, you know, maybe they're more about just kind of like having it in their in their studio or in their cave or what, whatever extra bedroom or whatever. And, and they're, you know, wanting to sit down and just play it the way they remember it. The CRT is a compelling option is all I'm saying, because that's part of what you remember, believe it or not, you know, and until you see it again, the, you know, and you see Daytona firing up on a CRT, you know, uh, and, and oftentimes CRTs have better speakers too, you know, and you just get that, you get that nostalgia wave coming back, you know? So I, I say folks should definitely try both and see what you like. You know, if you have the ability to go to a friend's house or, you know, check it out and decide for yourself. But for me, it's CRT all the way every day. I, I play mine through some pro, uh, PC CRTs, but I've got the scan lines and on there and everything like, so it looks great. But yeah, so that's just me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man, actually I made the biggest mistake years ago with my CRTs because I went as big as I could go. Mm, mm. You know, I went the 32 and 34 inch route. Right. And of course that wound up being a tremendous problem as I got older, because I started having to move. I had a family to, you know, concern myself with space became an issue. So if you're interested in a CRT man, be realistic on the size and the weight of that sucker. Yeah. You know, go after something that is 20 inch, 19 inch, maybe, exactly. you know, you know, don't get something that takes three freaking people to carry it, you know? Seriously. Seriously. You're not, <laughs> not to mention you, that you could break your back or you could break the CRT. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I have to say, I get a, I get a chuckle from, those those videos of some dude thinking he can lift one of those things by himself and then like oh. falling falling backwards and the whole thing just gets completely wasted. Oh uh, yeah. You know, it's kind of funny, but I mean I guess you have to live and learn. <laughs> oh yeah, man. You start messing around with those widescreen Sony CRTs that came oh, yeah. out back in 2004. They are so heavy. Those things are 300 pounds. Yes, yes. You know, you trying to lift it by yourself, you better be ripped exactly. <laughs> and ready and ready to go, man, because that is going to be a hell of a job. It's not just heavy, but it's awkward, right? Mm. You know, because it's like it, this huge mass, you know, it's not exactly. like it's not like lifting a dumbbell, you know? <laughs> yeah. And those sharp plastic pieces underneath of it, man, they tear your hands all the Oh, hell. no kidding. No kidding. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> People aren't kidding when they say bring a friend, you know? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Just try to stick with the smaller ones. In this case, size, yeah. the bigger size isn't the better thing to go, you know, the better way to go. Yeah. I've got a <laughs> NEC and a Mitsubishi and they're both 22 inch, which right. is the big, biggest you can get for like a PC CRT, but they're, yeah. um, but still manageable. I can lift one by myself, you know, although right. it's still really heavy. <laughs> Even yeah. at that, it's, it's pretty heavy. But yeah, so, um, well, thanks for joining me, man. I mean, I, we could probably talk forever. <laughs> I know, but I'm looking at the clock. We've run, run up over two hours now, just, you know, so <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to marinate on another topic that we can discuss next time. Maybe yeah. we'll get into Dreamcast or something like that, but yeah, no, it's been a blast. Yeah, man. It's great. Every time we talk, dude, whenever you want to do it again, just let me know. Definitely. Well, anyway, thanks, Mel, for joining us. And uh, until next time, Saturn Dave and Sega Lord X reminding you that you must play Sega Saturn. See you later. 